Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a, a special pleasure to talk to you all about uh, uh, PI and women health. It's really a dear topic to my heart, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that I can at the end. I didn't make my slides too long to allow um, some discussion at the end, if you want. So. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest of anything that we're going to be discussing this afternoon. And uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, PI through the different um, phases of life that women faces uh, that are pretty much related to hormonal if we're going to break, uh, you know, uh, the impact of treatments on uh, uh, and primary immune deficiency on women's health. As you expect, most of the focus and uh, a lot of studies uh, are being done for women in their childbearing age because of the pregnancy outcomes. So this is what we're going to be spending the majority of the talk about. But as well, we're going to discuss about uh, the, uh, the uh, postmenopausal, and we're going to share some of the research data that are available in the literature, as well as the childhood. Um, so. We are going to start by admitting that women in the world of primary immune deficiency disorders are unique. Uh, they face different challenges from men, and some of them are very unique to the fact that some of the genetics uh, that are involved in uh, and cause primary immunodeficiency disorders uh, in the United States are um, inherited through the X-linked pattern. So you've been hearing through the conference about the X-linked inheritance, and uh, women have uh, two Xs versus males have an X and Y. So when a woman is pregnant, if she's pregnant with a female, she gives one of her Xs and the man gives the other X. So the, the offspring has one X from the mom and one X from the dad. So if the woman is a carrier of uh, a gene that causes primary immune deficiency disorder, one of the two X's, so she has a one in two chance of passing that X to the baby. If the baby is a female, she's automatically going to get the second X from dad, so that woman would be a carrier. But if it's just a boy, then the boy is not going to get a second X from the dad. He's going to get a Y. And that will lead to, in half of the times, one of two chances that the boy is going to have the disease. Now, in the past, we used to think that the carriers are asymptomatic, and it's only if the boy inherits the X gene that they are going to be symptomatic. But we know from data on multiple diseases that are caused by X link that actually the females are symptomatic. And the majority of the data are coming from chronic rheumatoid disease that actually women could have symptoms and they could have infections, and as well they can have unique features to them as carriers when they have autoimmunity. So that's the first line about inheritance uh, that is unique to women. In other countries in where uh, consanguinity is common, then uh, women and men are equally affected by the autosomal recessive disorders. They are not the most common in the U.S., but they are the most common in many other parts of the world in where consanguinity is a problem. The hormonal changes through different stages of a uh, woman's life affect the immune system. And we're not going to have time to go through the, uh, the immune studies that were done, but in brief, changes in hormones during different times do affect the immune cells. So some of those changes actually activate the immune system, and that's why you might see some uh, autoimmunity that flare during time of puberty. And uh, some of the time, those hormonal changes actually suppress the immune system. So for example, a pregnant woman, even if she's healthy, she's a little bit more immune suppressed than a woman her age who's not pregnant. That's usually nature trying to allow this baby to stay and for the woman's body not to reject it. So we know that different hormones affect the immune system in different ways. Women in PID world face unique challenges and decisions that they have to make about pregnancy and um, birth control. And as well, in general, in the United States and in research across the nation, women to be more caregivers to uh, people with uh, special needs compared to men. So women will end up being more of caregivers to patients with PID uh, compared to men. Of course, both men and women can be caregivers, excellent caregivers, but it's just the research that suggests that more women tend to be caregivers in general. So. 
The challenges that we face when we do any kind of research on women um, with any kind of chronic illness is that if you are going to study a drug, for example, most of the initial studies will exclude women with childbearing age, or they will require that the woman is on two birth control measures between her and her partner to prevent pregnancy. And if a woman gets pregnant, unless the study is specifically designed to a drug that is going to be used in pregnancy, then pregnant women will be excluded from the study. This limits our knowledge on a lot of things uh, that affect uh, uh, the, you know, how medications affect pregnancy, about how illnesses affect pregnancy. And now there is a push from the National Institute of Health to kind of look at uh, vulnerable uh, populations, including women. So now if you're going to exclude women, you have to explain why you're excluding women from your studies in the hopes that we can be more inclusive and understand women health, uh, you know, better. And now there are studies for drugs that are FDA approved that are doing specific arms on women. So now we establish the safety of a specific drug in both men and women. They will allow women who are pregnant to, to be enrolled or at least do some registries to report on the outcomes of women who happen to be pregnant while on specific drugs. When we look at the literature of what is available about women health and primary immune deficiencies, uh, you know, proper studies are really limited, and most of the data that we have come from anecdotal reports and case series. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to um, uh, co-author this chapter on primary immune deficiency in pregnancy, and it was fun to kind of just go through this exercise with one of my mentees, Dr. Ekta Kakar, who's now a fellow at National Jewish. So what we were charged with is to actually cover all the outcomes of pregnancy in all primary immunodeficiency disorders. So it was kind of an exhaustive summary of what's present in the medical literature about all primary immune deficiency, not only CVID or specific primary immune deficiency. And all, although we thought it's going to be a, an exhaustive task, the truth is at the end of the day, most of the data were, you know, uh, limited to case reports for the majority of primary immune deficiency except for CVID. So, we're going to go through some examples, but there is not much in the literature, and that's why we. this session is important because it kind of highlights the uh, importance of studying women health in PID. But this book is available to download through Springer website if anybody is interested. So uh, I like to start with this study for multiple reasons. This is the study uh, that is the larger that is published in the literature on any uh, disease in primary immune deficiency, which is CVID. And this study actually was generated by data from the Immune Deficiency Foundation survey that was sent uh, uh, about four years ago to women specifically who have antibody deficiency. And the survey was um, was a web-based, so might be that some of you actually participated in the study and the responses were um, collected and the data were analyzed, and I'll share with you some of those information. The study asked women whether they ever got pregnant, and if they did got pregnant, asked them about what happened with their pregnancy and what happened to the offspring, and then they asked them experiences about how did the doctors uh, manage their pregnancies, did they change the immunoglobulins, uh, did they do anything different. So I'll walk you through the most important parts of the study, and I believe the study is available on the IDF website. But uh, out of the, um, uh, the survey went out uh, to all uh, registered females in the IDF, and they had about five 590 females who responded to the study. So the data were analyzed on those 590 uh, females. Uh, the age ranged from 18 to 81, so you have a very good range. Of course, they only targeted adults in this study. Uh, the average was 49. As you expect, the majority of the patients who have antibody deficiency are CVID, so 83% were uh, CVIDs, and the, the rest were hypogamma globulinemia, who somehow did not meet the criteria for CVID diagnosis. The majority of the women were on immunoglobulin replacement therapy at the time when the study was done. So the first question uh, that the study asked, how many of the women who are registered in the IDF got pregnant? Uh, so it doesn't mean that all those women had living children, but it's just were they, were they able to get pregnant. And if you take 100 women uh, in CVID, the study suggests that 70 of them were going to be able to get pregnant. 
This is not a bad number, but it's actually lower than the national average. If you take 100 healthy women in the US, then 85 of them will get pregnant. But if you take those pregnant women and looked at what happened to them, the spontaneous loss, like uh, they had a miscarriage, the average was the same between women who had CVID and women who, uh, who did not have CVID, like what we call national norms. So if they get pregnant, they did not have more miscarriages than what is expected for uh, a healthy woman. The decision to terminate pregnancy in that survey was lower than it was reported in the national average, and it differed by uh, whether it's the first pregnancy, the second, or the third pregnancy. So um, uh, out of 1,000 uh, live births, um, there was uh, 159 uh, abortion, that's the national uh, average um, in the first pregnancy, and then it kind of goes lower with the second and the third, and this kind of was repeated, the same pattern was repeated in a uh, woman with CVID. Now, when they asked women who wanted to get pregnant, the first question was how many got pregnant. They didn't ask them whether it was an intentional pregnancy or that it just happened or they, they um, have went through fertility treatment to get pregnant. But the second question was uh, how many of those women who actually got pregnant had any difficulty getting pregnant? And this is now the infertility. And 72% of the women said that they did not have difficulty getting pregnant. Again, this is kind of similar to the national average. And they then asked the woman who had a child who have CVID or hypogammaglobulinema and already have at least one child who have a primary immune deficiency. And they asked them whether they have decided after having one child with immune deficiency whether they wanted to have more children or not. 60% of the women said that the fact that they had a child with immune deficiency did not prevent them from wanting to have another child. Now, what happened with those pregnancies? Out of the women who got pregnant, 72% were able to make it through pregnancy and delivered a living child. 19% either had a miscarriage or had a stillbirth. 7% elected to terminate the pregnancy and 1% was an ectopic pregnancy. Now, the, the other question other than knowing the outcomes kind of observation, they asked the patients how did the doctors manage uh, their treatments? And in the case of CVID, the most important thing was um, managing immunoglobulins. So 23% of the women said that the doctor adjusted their dose of immunoglobulin mostly by increasing their dose towards the end of the uh, pregnancy. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. But this is actually just kind of what we call the raw data, like what what the survey uh, concluded just out of uh, the responses from those women. So the study concluded that overall, this is good news. Although the fertility rate uh, in, the, uh, in the CVID population is lower than the national average, but this study showed that if a woman gets pregnant who has CVID, then she has the ability to carry to term and deliver a living child. And they showed actually that if a CVID woman wants to get pregnant, then they didn't have difficulty in getting pregnant higher than the national average. So all of this suggests that there is a possibility for females with CVID and all hypogamma globulinemia that were included in the study were able to get pregnant and successfully carry pregnancy to term. Of course, the fertility rate was lower, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a couple of more slides, about what we think the reason that the fertility in general of a pregnancy happening, not planning a pregnancy, but just happening, why it is lower in CVID patients compared to the general population. And then they, they talk a little bit about that. Uh, there is concern about the outcomes of, of pregnancies. So there was one important message that I thought I wanted to highlight in the study. One of the things that they asked the patients of how many of them were diagnosed with CVID during pregnancy. One out of four women were diagnosed with CVID during one of their pregnancies. This is actually concerning, but the way we can explain it that a lot of times women in childbearing age do not go to see the doctors because they are very, very busy either with college, work, or actually having children. So they might have infections and they just put it, you know, put it off that, oh, it's a sinus infection, it's a pneumonia, I'm getting sick because the kids are sick. 
But then that when they are pregnant and they are under the care of a doctor, then maybe it's triggering that, oh, she got two sinus infection when she's pregnant, let's check immunoglobulins, and that's actually triggered infection. So there is a message that we have to take here that women in the childbearing age need to be more aware that there is a possibility of uh, primary immune deficiency, and if a woman is having frequent infections in that age, it's important for her to get checked, especially if they plan on having children, because the outcomes of the babies are affected by the low immunoglobulins. So um, what do we do in our experiences at Baylor with women who are pregnant? We normally, if a, 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 a woman who is in the childbearing age decided to get pregnant, we prefer that she get a consultation with OB, and if she comes to us pregnant, we do refer all our pregnant women to high-risk OB at Baylor. And the reason is we, we consider patients with primary immune deficiency to, disorders to be high-risk, uh, because there is a risk of uh, miscarriages, there are risk of infections, and especially if the patient is not established on immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Of course, as well, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Women with CVID, like men, are prone to autoimmune diseases. So it's important for high-risk OB to evaluate women who are pregnant and it's uh, for us as well as immunologists to screen for autoimmune diseases during pregnancy because some of those autoimmune, such as low platelet, might affect the decision about whether the anesthesiologist is going to be willing to do epidural or where we should do the delivery under general anesthesia if they wanted to have some kind of pain-free labor. Of course, there is risk about blood clotting as well with some kind of autoimmune disorders that might lead to loss of pregnancy. So it's very important to do that. Um, we have very extreme cases in which CVID has affected the lung significantly and the woman had a decreased lung capacity or they require oxygen. Getting pregnant might actually put more uh, pressure on the heart. And uh, we, in those very rare situations, we had to consult with both cardiology, pulmonary and OB and explain to the patients their options about getting pregnant. That is considered to be very high risk. There were times, unfortunately, that we have to tell our patients, you just, it's not safe for you to try to get pregnant because you're not going to be able to, to uh, carry the load and uh, go through uh, labor, even if it was under general anesthesia, because it just puts so much pressure on the heart and lungs. In specific cases in which CVID, for example, runs in the family or there are specific genes that are known that this pa those patients carry, we do recommend genetic counseling. I always try to tell my patients, not when they are pregnant, but uh, even before that, uh, that, you know, you carry this mutation, do you plan to get pregnant, do you think about getting pregnant, if the answer is this, yes, then I do refer them to genetic counseling before they get pregnant because now they are making their decisions based on more information and they can weigh their risks and benefits before they get pregnant because once they get pregnant, their decisions are going to be very skewed by the fact that they are pregnant, so they may not have all the options that they have before. What we do if a woman is already on immunoglobulin replacement therapy and pregnant, we monitor immunoglobulin levels every month. I, I, when one of my patients with CVID gets pregnant, I see her every month. We measure the levels, and we do adjust the dosing. So in that survey, only 23% of the women said their dosing was adjusted. We tend to adjust everybody, and the reason is the babies um, – uh, are actually dependent on the mom for the first six months of life for their immunoglobulins. And the IgG actually crosses the placenta and actually provides that immunity to the baby. In pregnancy, in general, even in healthy women, because there is more fluid retention, their IgG levels is actually lower than their baseline, even if they don't have CVID. So more so if they are CVID and they are getting immunoglobulins, it could be that they are dropping, and we want to make sure that we keep their levels actually on the higher end, like towards 1,000. This is specifically applicable if uh, a patient has autoimmunity, especially in the way of ITP, uh, hepatic uh, thrombocytopenic purpura, when their platelets are low, because in that way we can help maintain their platelets at higher level. So we don't have to worry about anesthesia, worrying about, like, I cannot do epidural because the platelets are so low and I don't want you to bleed around the spinal cord. And um, we 
most of our patients tend to want to deliver in the hospital, but uh, you know, every now and then it comes up. We do recommend that all deliveries ha happen in the hospital, just because uh, there have been some reports about um, n uh, poor growth of the baby in uterus or some complications during birth or shortly after. So we do uh, recommend that all babies are delivered in the hospital. So this is specifically about CBID because we know that CBID is associated with autoimmunity immune dysregulation. But in the literature, there are reports about other primary immune deficiency disorder in which antibody deficiency is part of the syndrome, although it's not all of it. So I'm not gonna cover all of it. This is all present in the book chapter that I showed you, but I wanted to highlight some that are more common or they have kind of unique features. So hyper IgE syndrome, especially the STAT3 deficiency is an autosomal dominant means that uh, it goes in from one generation to the other 50% rate, whether it's a man or a woman carrying the gene and whether the offspring is a boy or a girl. There have been reports about successful pregnancies in STAT3 deficiency hyper IgE. The woman w did have infections when they were pregnant, very similar to what they would have when they are not pregnant. Uh, but of course, um, sometimes the decision about treating with specific antibiotics might change because some of the antibiotics do cross the placenta and might have a negative impact on the baby. So people have to be selective about the specific antibiotics that they can use. In hyper IgM syndrome, which um, you may know, the majority of the patients are X-linked, so it only uh, in that form it affects only boys, but there are, there is less than 10% of the people who have the autosomal recessive, meaning it could affect both men and women. In that cohort of women who have hyper IgM syndrome because they have the autosomal recessive gene, there have been two cases that are reported in the literature that they said the woman got pregnant and they got some infections during pregnancy. So we have to keep an open mind about all the possibilities, not only in CVID and antibody deficiency, but other uh, types of uh, primary immunodeficiency. Now, something that is very exciting for me, because you know, maybe um, 30 or 40 years ago, the slide will not even exist about skid because babies used to die within the first year of life. But now, uh, the largest cohort almost reached 40 years of skid survivors. So a lot of those skid survivors are actually um, reaching, uh, you know, childbearing age, and some of them want to get pregnant and. Uh, now we know that for the upcoming generation, that is the generation of the newborn screen for SCID, we could do better. So as you know that SCID in the past was diagnosed when infections started to happen unless there is a family history. And the treatment still till now is by far the bone marrow transplant and gene therapy, which both require to suppress the immune system, we call it conditioning. Some of the conditioning regimen tries to completely wipe off the immune system that exists before to allow the new uh, graft to take. But those um, regimens tend to wipe off the, uh, the cells of the reproductive system as well, because those cells tend to replicate very, uh, you know, very quickly during puberty. But sometimes even if you expose a, a small child to those medications, it might affect their reproductive organs and they might become infertile. So there was a recent study that looked backwards at babies who were transplanted and looked at the patients who, called, who got what we call myeloablative regimen, means that their immune system was completely wiped off, compared to what we call reduced intensity conditioning when they use medications either at lower doses or just kind of lower regimen to kind of not completely wipe off the immune system, just kind of drop it uh, so it does not reject the graft but not completely wipe it off. It showed that, interestingly, boys did not seem to matter which regimen they had. A good percentage of them were able to reach puberty if they lived to reach puberty. So um, they were able to form sperms and they reached puberty. Versus women, actually, the ovaries did not always mature if the girls saw the, the completely uh, uh, the ablating regimen compared to the reduced intensity. So now this is taken into consideration when the transplant decision is being made, especially with the newborn era, when you have a, a newborn that you could diagnose them within the first month of life and hopefully transplant them within the first three and a half months of life before they had infections, you could decide on a regimen that is less intense if, if you can. Now, if if you 
you can't, then now there are options that are still experimental to uh, preserve fertility for both boys and girls, and that includes sometimes freezing a piece of the ovary or a piece of the testicle for the children who are going to go for transplant before they have reached puberty because they st did not start uh, you know, uh, producing eggs and they did not start to produce sperm, so you have to actually take a biopsy from the organ itself. If somebody is going through transplant when they actually reach puberty then and you have time to induce ovulation, then um, you harvest the eggs just the same way they do for IVF and you freeze those eggs for later use. So there are options. Some of those options are still experimental in the U.S., uh, but uh, I see the future coming to more of this becoming FDA approved, hopefully, as the need for it is going to increase. Now, other diagnoses have very unique features. One of them is ataxia, telangiectasia. It's a very rare disorder in which the blood vessels are dilated everywhere, including in the uterus. And as well, there is a devastating neurological problem that happens at the level of the cerebellum. Uh, and they have immune deficiency. Um, if there is a girl who have ataxia telangiectasia, theoretically, the blood vessels that are enlarged in the uterus will cause this girl to bleed uh, heavily during menstrual period. So there have been one case report that we were able, all in the literature anywhere in the world that has been reported, that one woman was able to get pregnant and deliver a healthy newborn. There is a theoretical risk about bleeding. I tried to look. Um, uh, to see if um, removing the uterus or being on certain medications to stop the period altogether recommended. It's not reported in the literature, so it's going to be based on the clinical practice of the people. The George syndrome is another unique group of uh, patients who do have uh, uh, immune deficiency that varies whether the whole thymus is gone or just part of it. The ones who have the complete thymus that is gone behave so much like skid and they require transplant or a thymus transplant early on. But there is a group who have part of their thymus absent, so their immune deficiency is less severe and they could survive for several decades and their immune deficiency might worsen over time. Some of those people as well, uh, whether they have what we could complete the George and they don't have a, a thymus at all or they have part of it, they have other issues. Of course, the cleft palate, uh, the uh, heart disease, the hypoparathyroidism. Uh, and as well, some of them have attention deficit disorder and some mental disability. So uh, when there was a large cohort of the George patients, uh, the George syndrome woman, and um, uh, the investigators looked at how many of those women actually had children. And 83% of that cohort, the women did not have children. And um, it could be that the mental disability is a concern. So if a woman is not able to take care of herself, then her having a child uh, becomes even more problematic. And some women will decide not to become fertile uh, and not have children because of concern of inheritable uh, disorder. I've talked a little bit about CGD, uh, that uh, there are the patients who actually have the CGD and there are the women who actually have the X-linked uh, carriers and they could be symptomatic. So that's another consideration. Now, I showed you before that the there are uh, low fertility in patients with primary immune deficiency disorder in general. According to the evidence that is available in the literature, it could be actually by choice. That woman who carry a gene with primary immune deficiency decide not to have any more children because uh, they went through PID and they did not want to. It could be because of the autoimmunity that could sometimes lead to miscarriages or complicates the pregnancy and sometimes because of the medications that could affect the pregnancy outcomes. So patients have to be on contraception because it's, uh, it's not uh, safe to be pregnant while taking those medications. So those are as, as well decisions that women take. Um, into consideration when they decide whether they want to have a baby or not. I've probably covered this and I was told I have to hurry up, but I want to say that uh, both um, subcutaneous immunoglobulins and IV IG are both uh, 
been uh, shown to be safe in pregnancy. Some uh, previous consideration was sub-Q might be not possible in pregnant women, but there have been studies that show that sub-Q is okay. Initiating immunoglobulins during pregnancy if a woman is just diagnosed is okay and actually should not be put out till after delivery because we know that the newborn is going to be dependent on that IgG. So you really want to get it through, uh, specifically uh, through the third trimester. Breastfeeding comes up quite a bit, and um, you know, for mothers who deliver babies with severe combined immune deficiency, the practices vary. There is a, a paper that is in press that comes in from our group at Texas Children that looked at women who d delivered babies with kid and whether um, they stopped or not, and they looked at CMV, which is one of the major concerns, and they, it showed that in each group there was one child who got CMV whether they stopped breastfeeding or not. So it's still out for debate. We have to talk about each case uh, differently so we cannot make any recommendations at this moment. Uh, but for um, not skid, like if a child has an immune deficiency that does not require transplant, we normally will not ask the mothers to stop breastfeeding because if there is no con concern about CMV, then uh, breastfeeding might be encouraged in those cases. Caring a mother with PID, caring for children have specific considerations. We do recommend that the household do get their, all their vaccines if they have a parent who have a primary immune deficiency, including live vaccines. But if a mother has an immune deficiency and her baby is going to get the rotavirus or one of the live viral vaccines, we recommend that somebody else change the diapers for at least four weeks because there is a possibility of the woman who have primary immune deficiency disorder catching that infection because there is always a possibility that live viral vaccines might actually cause a very minor disease like the baby could shed uh, some of the rotavirus in their stool for about four weeks. Uh, mothers of young children could pick up infections that their kids pick up from the daycare and siblings as well. Uh, our Texas Children's Hospital has specific rules about ch sibling visitations and how to manage at home uh, if they have a child with primary immunodeficiency disorder. Now, I'm going to be very brief about contraception. Uh, there are contraception. You might have seen those in the offices of OB. This is I just got from the web. But uh, it says that, you know, there are different contraception and how they work. The concern about primary immune deficiency in the past, they used to say IUDs are not safe. And IUDs could be the ones that have hormones and the ones that do not have hormones. The ones with hormones usually will stop the period completely. The ones without hormones actually might cause the bleeding to be more because it's a foreign body in the uterus. So usually the women have heavier period. So there were concerns that if a woman have an IUD and she gets a sexually transmitted infection, then she might get what we call pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, or PID, uh, more frequently. But there were studies that were done on HIV pregnant women, and it showed that this is not the case. So it could be that IUDs be used uh, in women who have primary immune deficiency, and they are safe. Um, the hormonal ones suppress the period, so it could be that it, it's used both to prevent pregnancy and as well to prevent bleeding. So we have a lot of families who the child with PID have multiple chronic illnesses, so caring for them is difficult. So having a period adds to the changing of diaper and cleaning and hygiene, so stopping the period altogether might be easier, so this could be used as well. But it's very important to remember that IUD does not protect against sexually transmitted diseases, and it's always important to remind young girls about this, that yes, you, you'll not get pregnant, but it doesn't mean that you may not catch an infection that way. So um, I want to show you this, that postmenopause women are at unique risk for osteoporosis, uh, those data come in from the Duke cohort that found that 45% of women with any kind of primary immune deficiency have osteoporosis by age 65. It could be that a lot of women get infections. Um, um, tends to be that primary care doctors and even ENT, if somebody has a sinus infection, they give them a course of steroid, and if that's three or four infections per year, this is three or four courses of steroids per year, and this certainly affects the bone. And sometimes people have fatigue and they are not able to be exercising and low physical activity. If you are malnourished, uh, then um, adds to the osteoporosis. Cancer is an important one. And this is something that we go over almost all our patients when they visit with us. 
So there was a survey that came from the U.S. Immune Deficiency Network that showed that women specifically are at higher risk for skin cancer and gastric cancer. So uh, we have data to suggest that patients with CVID in general at higher risk for GI malignancy in general. So we want all the women to get their at least by age required screening for endoscopy and colonoscopy. Uh, we want all women to get their pelvic exams and mammograms. Skin seems to be neglected for a lot of people, but skin cancer is actually still the highest uh, cancer uh, among patients with primary immune deficiency disorder. And uh, it's very important to, to, for somebody to examine the skin. They could stand in front of a mirror, or have a partner, look at their skin altogether, um, and uh, you know, get any kind of new mole or kind of concerning finding be checked. Uh, childhood uh, consideration, we talked about this a little bit, like preserving fertility for, for children, depends a lot on the age of the transplant and radiation, and we've talked about freezing the eggs uh, or freezing ovarian tissue, and that's kind of um, uh, still in research. So here are kind of like general do's and, not, uh, and do nots for women. Um, do exercise, get daylight exposure, balanced diet, do your cancer screening, do not put it off. Of course, smoking and substance abuse is a problem, including vaping in that specific scenario. There have been some discussions in the past, can I do pedicure and manicure, we say, um, I tell my patients who absolutely have to do it, some of them cannot do it themselves because they are elderly, to purchase their own kit and take it with them to the salon so they actually know that it's cleaned after every use because some of the salons, they don't clean very well. They, so you don't want to have a, those kind of infections that are, sometimes are, are hard to treat. Be careful with tattoos and body piercing because it could uh, you know, be at risk for uh, infection. So if you are to do one, make sure that this is a certified place. And um, you know, the other thing that people ask about extensions for the eyelashes, we, we say it's usually okay, but make sure that it's tested somewhere else, not the eye, to make sure that people are not allergic to the adhesive products. So with that, uh, I really believe that women in general are very unique. Women in the PID are very unique. So I really thank you for being here today, and I'm going to start answering questions. So the first question is excellent. How often should women have bond, bone density screening if they are uh, postmenopausal? You start with one, and if it's normal and the risk factors did not change, so it's usually one, uh, you know, uh, one screening one. And if it's normal, we don't normally do it again unless there is another indication. But if somebody has low bone density, then uh, endocrinologist will decide. For example, we'll treat you with calcium or vitamin D, or you're going to have you do exercise or start treatment, and then they follow up on that depending on the severity of the disease. But that's an excellent question. Can, can you carry a full-term pregnancy with healthy baby while the mother is 100% TPN dependent? This is a, a very... Um, so the answer is I really don't know. There is no data in the literature. Uh, TPN uh, can put the risk of uh, bloodstream infections. Sometimes those are fungal infections that could uh, require medications that are known to be um, teratogenic, means they can hurt the baby. So um, that should be taken into consideration. I personally would not say to somebody, no, you cannot do that. But I, I try to tell the people that those are the options that are available, and this is what we know. And, you know, people make decisions based on their personal, you know, background, what they want. But uh, TPN as well, if somebody is TPN dependent, it could be that because they have a lot of GI losses. And to support pregnancy, uh, a woman has to have certain amount of certain vitamins, including the B vitamins and folic acid, and that's important for the neurodevelopment of a baby. So um, the TPN will provide all of that, but if somebody is completely losing through the gut and that's why they are on TPN, that's another consideration to take. Uh, there, are, there is a question about heart block and antibodies. And uh, yes, there are some antibodies that could pass through the placenta and, and cause the, the heart block. So we usually partner with our rheumatologist and even uh, consult with the cardiologist if, if, if the woman harbor those antibodies and want to go through pregnancy. Um, 
how often do you need to change I, uh, IUD if you are if you have CVID? Uh, there are no data that you need to change it more often than what is recommended. So uh, the uh, medicated IUD, I think now is up to 10 years. So I would just uh, follow whatever the the labels are. If you are experiencing infertility uh, change uh, challenges during childbearing age, are there any recommendations for improving egg quality? So we. At Baylor, we have the high pregnancy and we have the infertility group, and we partner with them. Um, I cannot give you a, a specific advice of what is being done because improving fertility is even a challenge for women who do not have a primary immune deficiency. From our end, what we try to make sure are the women are on the therapeutic levels of IgG. We check their vitamins to make sure that they are not deficient in any vitamin, and if they are, we try to supplement. If there is an autoimmunity, we try to make sure that this autoimmunity is under control because it could complicate the pregnancy. Even at the beginning, it could cause some clots that prevent the placenta from developing. So, but I, we always partner with the uh, uh, fertility doctors. Uh, dealing with GI issues, weight loss, malabsorption, how can this affect menstruation? And uh, can, uh, how can lack of menstruation affect fertility? So the first question, and those are excellent questions, by the way. So um, yes, if a woman is severely malnourished, for any reason, whether it's BID, HIV, uh, cancer, then uh, they sometimes will not have menstruation. A lot of our patients are actually not menstruating by choice. They are on medications because they prefer not to because of multiple reasons, including um, risk of infection, tiredness, and those hormonal changes and sometimes pain. Um, if the lack of menstruation is happening, because of medications that you can take off, then fertility should not be a problem. But if a woman is malnourished enough that she's not having the period, then it could indicate that the ovulation is not happening. Again, I'm not an OBGYN, so we always partner with OBGYN when we have those questions because their in, uh, you know, insight is very important and they sometimes do hormonal testing to see if a woman is going through different stages of hormonal changes. And... Uh, you know, they as well can image the ovaries, do studies on the uterus to, to make sure that all the organs are, has developed completely normal. Uh, if your body cannot support a pregnancy, what do you recommend for having a baby? So again, those are uh, difficult questions. Um, uh, surrogate um, uh, pregnancy um, has been talked about. Um, adoption has been talked about uh, in the past. Uh, I think this is the last question. Uh, what info is there on CVID patients with many complications like bronchiectasis and pregnancy? So uh, this study that I showed on the IDF is the largest study that has been reported in the literature on CVID in the US. There are some other studies uh, that come from the European countries that look at that, and it did show that women um, you know, had complications during pregnancy, like had more mastitis, had more miscarriages, so it's a little bit different from the findings here. Um, I think it's at this level, with the amount of knowledge that we have, it's going to be on case-by-case -case basis. I hope this was helpful. Yes? For my daughter, who has looked at all directions, is her only option for pregnancy um, PGD to have the surgery or well, I mean, I I would say that uh, those are really like very individual decisions, and um, as well, it depends on where she is and what is the capacity of that uh, fertility group. Can they select the eggs that do not carry the gene? This is um, still experimental in many ways, and it's not 100% guaranteed. So that she could go through all of this, but then it could be that they missed that this mutation happened. Some mutations happen after pregnancy, so we know that there are a good percentage of PID patients that they didn't inherit it from any parents, so there is always a risk that a child will come in with PID even if the mother does not have it. So it's really by case by case basis and depends on where you are and you know you know what choices do you have available in that specific center too. I think um, I was told our time is up, but thank you so much for your attention.